Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Astronomy Live. So, we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. I'm just finishing up uh, setting up the telescope and the computer connection to the telescope. But since the streaming computer is already ready, I figured why not just start the stream a little early. So that's one less thing I have to deal with later. Sit back, relax, and we will start in a few minutes. Hey guys, this is Garrett Wong, also known as Ensign Harry Kim from Star Trek Voyager. And you're watching Astronomy Live. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So I'm just calibrating the uh, camera now, and then we'll pick a target and start tracking some satellites. That first star you see, you uh, were seeing there, was Antares. All right, camera's calibrated. So now we just need some targets. So that is Jupiter and its moons. It's overexposed. It's very wide angle as you can see. But that's just to that's just to test the pointing accuracy of the scope and everything. Looks good. I'm going to see about okay, maybe that's a bad idea there. Right adjusting the camera exposure on the viewfinder camera. All right. Now, 
though you guys can't see that. I'm just remembering that now. I've got a slightly different setup tonight. I've got the proper setup where I've got the streaming computer separate from the tracking the satellites computer so that hopefully things run okay and we don't get uh, strange tracking issues from the computer being overloaded. is all this. Oh. I bet those are... Okay, I'm not logged in, first of all. So I'm just looking at what satellites are predicted to be going over tonight. I wasn't logged in, so it had me at sort of a default location on Heavens Above, and I'm looking at it, and there's all these unknown satellites passing over. I bet they're not unknown. I bet they're just uncatalogued. Um, I bet they're uncatalogued uh, Starlink satellites. Okay, now that I'm logged in, I'm going to check what satellites are currently overhead, what we can take a look at. So it's 8.51 now. Eight fifty five NOAA 11. 8.55 Ariane rocket debris. Magnitude 3.1. Oh wait, that's setting time. Uh, so actually, let's go here to something that's still rising. Monitor E gets to magnitude 4. That'll be a good test for the system. Okay, notepad. I have no idea what the satellite is. It's some random sat named Monitor E. We're just going to be tracking some targets of opportunity here tonight. And uh, just validate how well the software is working. Select the TLE file. Okay, we should be ready to go. Let's go ahead and start tracking. So this is coming up out of the south. It's going up past the moon. The uh, moon is first quarter and quite bright, so I might, oh, I can, I can already see it in the viewfinder camera. After it gets away from the moon a little more, I'll lock on to it. Oh, it's already it's already in the viewfinder. That's a beautiful thing right there. It's very close to where the orbit predicts it to be. So now I'm doing active tracking. Oh, it locked on to a rando star there instead of the correct satellite. There we go. Oh, it keeps walking onto background stars. There's a lot of them in the area. Okay, it's going to fly right by a bright star. I'm going to wait for it to go past. There we go. It's flying through the zenith. It's hard for it to keep up. So as you can see, it dances around a bit, but it does keep it in view for the most part. 
And this is fully automated tracking. I'm having a little bit of uh, processing hiccups here. Oh, I think it's uh, rotating as well. It dims out a bit, and then it comes back. You can see it flashing there, yeah. You can see how the satellite flashes. It's actually rotating. That's cool. So you see that flashing dot in the lower left there, close to center. That is the satellite. And you can see by the flashing that it's actually a rotating satellite. That's pretty cool. Alright, let's stop tracking that one. We've got a bright one coming up in a few minutes. Uh, let's see, this was Okean 2 or Okean 2 rocket debris. So first of all, I'm curious when Monitor E was launched, it's pretty obvious it's tumbling. Uh, it was launched in 2005 from uh, Russia on a ROCOT uh, launch vehicle. I'm not sure how they pronounce that, but yeah, it's a Russian satellite. And it appears to be out of commission based on how it's tumbling there. So, Okean 2 rocket debris, this was launched in two, or sorry, 1990, also from Russia. And it's in a 617 by 641 kilometer orbit. The last one was peaked at magnitude 4, visible but dim. It was launched in 2005, and it's in a 349 by 354 kilometer orbit. So that one will be coming back for reentry probably a lot sooner than this rocket debris that's still up there. Uh, and that is rising just now. I'm going to go ahead and grab my tablet here real quick. I'll be BR, I'll BRB and uh, check the chat. Alright gang, let me load up the orbital elements for this Okean rocket debris. It will also be going pretty much straight overhead. So yeah, everything right now is being tracked with uh, my set tracker software. So, Okean 2 rocket, an upper stage of a rocket that uh, was discarded in 19... Was it 1990? And it's just coming up over the trees now. Well, it's still in the trees. This one's also going to be going very close 
to the moon. We'll miss it by a few degrees, but not by much. Approaching the top of the trees. I'm looking for it. Oh yeah. It's in the view already. So you can see it there in the center of the view near those two hot pixels dancing around a little bit. This is just a upper stage of a rocket that's been discarded. It's tricky when these things are, you know, magnitude 4, magnitude 3, they're not really bright like the space station or the Hubble Space Telescope or something like that because background stars can be similar brightness and when you're doing brightness-based tracking like this it's uh, occasionally difficult. Windows wants to update. Not right now. See there it, it was confused by a star of similar brightness. Yeah, flat earthers also hate when you point out that satellites are real. See, that was clever of me. I disengaged tracking right before that star flew by so it wouldn't lock onto the star by accident. Disengaged optical tracking, I say. But even without optical tracking, it's pointing well enough that it's putting it in the field of view here. I am looking at a relatively wide field of view, but yeah, anytime, anytime a background star flies through, it's difficult. it gets confused. But yeah, it keeps it in there. Well, except when it locks onto a background star, like I said. That's going to about do it for that satellite. You see as soon as I stop tracking there how quickly it flies out of the field of view. It's almost in the tree line at the opposite side of the horizon now. So let's see what else we can find. Okay, we had... Kian. Said sat Delta rocket. Well, that's not till 944. Oh, wait. Okean 2 makes. Oh, it's a different Okean 2. I guess Okean 2 is the type of rocket. Or no, Okean 2 rocket. That was the rocket debris that put the satellite in orbit. Wait a minute. Is this the same? Well, I'll be doggone. So the payload that was put into orbit by that satellite will be passing over in about half an hour. It's not going to get terribly high. Um, and I think I'm actually catching it on the descending node of the orbit. So, anyway, I just was confused by that because I thought I was looking at the same thing. Uh, let's see. 
gets to 53. This one here, Cosmos 1975 rocket debris. A lot of Russian rocket debris up there tonight. Uh, it peaks in nine minutes, rises in four minutes, peaks at 72 degrees in the west, comes out of the north. A lot of polar orbit satellites right now. Those two, the two satellites we've looked at so far, they've both been polar, polar orbit satellites, or something close to it. Um, and that seems to be the name of the game here. Uh, GPS, oh that one's already rising, it'll be done in a couple minutes. Gets, alright, well, let me try it. I don't know if I'll get this one in time. Looks like a rocket stage that put a GPS satellite into orbit, I'm guessing. Unless it means something else completely. I'll look that up later. But for now, let's just try to track it. Oh, shoot, my telescope's got to go the long way around. You guys just saw inside my house. No, you didn't see much, did you? Telescope's focused on the stars, not the inside of my house. Whenever I get the question, do you use that thing to peep on people? The answer is no. It's not really great for that anyway. Okay, this one's not gonna be visible very long. It's gonna go into Earth's shadow very quickly. This, there it is, right there. And when I say very quickly, I mean very quickly. It is tumbling. You can see how it increases in brightness and then decreased in brightness there for a moment. So it is rotating at some sort of rate. Stop movie recording. And it's fading out as it goes into Earth's shadow. And it's gone. Cool. Okay, so let's find out what that was. That was GPS 2 05 rocket. Launched to December 11th, 1989 from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station on a Delta 6925. It was a Delta II rocket, upper stage. And I'm guessing that corresponds to a particular GPS satellite. GPS Block 2. Probably Satellite 5, I guess. So yeah, that put a GPS satellite into orbit, I think. Let's verify that. Yep, satellites by launch date, USA 49, 11 December 1989, according to Wikipedia there. Yep. So that put a GPS satellite into orbit in 1989, which operated until February 23rd, 2005. So that satellite is now retired, and of course the upper stage isn't doing anything. But uh, that's a nice segue right there, because I wanted to go track some GPS satellites now. So let's see what we can find for Navstar GPS, US GPS satellites. See if anything is overhead. And this is going to be a little bit different. So I think I'm going to have to um, switch cameras, possibly. Maybe to the S Big, or maybe just to the Samsung. The wide field viewfinder now is not going to be useful 
for tracking these things because they're going to be much dimmer than anything you can see by naked eye. And the wide field camera would be way too distracted by all the background stars even if it could see that dim. But I do want to see what I can do about tracking some GPS satellites overhead. I could also do this another way. Actually, that might be the best way to do it, is just use this camera but run long exposures on it. We'll see. So these are in much higher orbits, which will make them more difficult to observe. We're talking 20,000 kilometers versus 3 to 600 kilometers. Uh, I should have bookmarked that one I found earlier that was making a good pass at around this time. going through them. There's a lot of GPS satellites, as you might imagine. Ah, uh, here's one. Navstar 58 USA 190. Uh, here we go. Hang on, guys. I've got to get a uh, cable release for the camera. Be right back. So, now I gotta go to bulb. Quite work. I do playback. Come on. Oh. No, that is the picture. Alright. So now it takes a dark frame and then it displays the picture. Okay, good. So it is working. So, not the most efficient way to do things, I guess. Might be easier with the S-Big camera, but we're just going to make do with the Canon SLR for tonight. So, Navstar 58. Let's see, that should be, that should definitely be in sunlight, and it should be 
Oh yeah, it's it's right overhead. Uh, nine fourteen. It's gonna be in the west, rising. Okay, cool. And no signal because the camera shut off. That's fine. Select TLE file, Navstar fifty eight, and go. if we can find it. We'll do it. We'll start with a 10 second exposure. Come on. Okay, I released a little late on that. Close enough. Now it'll take a dark frame of equal length, and then it will display the picture. And hopefully we'll have a satellite in there with some star streaks. Well, we got some star streaks. Let's try that one more time. About a five second exposure there. can run them longer if need be, and I mean, if I get real desperate, I can always uh, switch to the S-Big cam. Okay, I don't know why it disconnected me there for a second. Hopefully, you guys are still seeing this. So, it's going to take a one minute dark frame. And I'm going to silence that insufferable beeping. chat says while we wait for that dark frame. Oh, dark frame complete. Yeah, I think it's in there. Uh, we play back that image one more time. So, I don't know, I thought I saw it. Let's see. Definitely thought I saw it there in the image, but I don't know if that's a hot pixel or the actual satellite. Well, we'll have to uh, I'll have to take a look at the images once I get them downloaded. I'm gonna try one more thing here. Stand by. We're going to try one more picture here. Well, 
Well, maybe a couple more, but I just want to see if this works any better. A 30 second exposure there, so let's see if we see anything. You guys talking about Elder Scrolls in the chat? What are you guys talking about in there? I, I look at the chat, somebody's talking about skooma and a cheese wheel. something here. Out of my way, chair. Oh, it might be there in the bottom of the image. Might be. Okay. Oops. Didn't mean to even take that one. I'm just going to run a really long, crazy image here. Let's see if we can pick it up. Oh, super chat from Copernicus Thinker, two dollars. Most inactive moment here equals ten times better than cat vids. Thank you, thank you, Copernicus. Astronomy does usually require patience. Copernicus Thinker says I meant to add that twenty-nine inch stop from Coulter Optical in the nineteen eighties was only two thousand nine hundred dollars, unheard of today. Wow, yeah. Of course, that's nineteen eighties dollars, but still. Thank you, Rezovsky. Alright. That ought to do it. If that doesn't do it, I don't know what would. I mean, if that doesn't do it, then maybe it's just not in the field of view for some reason. Maybe I need a wider angle scope. Maybe I need to throw the wide field refractor on there. I'm not going to go chase that, though, if that's the case. We'll move on to uh, the moon and then Saturn, I think. So hang in there, guys. We've got gonna gonna have some good views of uh, Saturn here in a few minutes tonight. I just would really like to get a picture of a GPS satellite. That's something I've never. And it could be tricky. I mean, these satellites are really high, really far out there. Almost as far as geostationary distance. Let's 
So they could be quite dim. And I might need, I really just might need the yes big camera. I mean, that could be all there is to it. Arr. see anything that's unambiguously definitely the satellite so I'll download the memory card and see if I can if I look at it in full resolution uh, does it pop out at me it might so for now let's go visit the moon Didn't mean to go auto ISO. Did I hear about that colorful gel the China probe discovered on the moon? I heard something about it. Um, hadn't had time to look into it, really. Okay, so we got the moon. Let's switch to a different camera. I don't know why OBS disconnected there. And I've got no idea why. Uh, So as you can see, the moon's just rising up out of the trees for me, and we're going to go ahead and switch this camera onto the telescope now.
you imagine how cool it would be to film an Orion rocket liftoff transit against the moon's disk? Yeah, that would be that would be really cool. Well, if they do a launch for the moon uh, positioned right, maybe I'll try to get that. But I don't know. I don't know whether SLS is really going to be the way forward or not. Let's just say I have my doubts. nose piece on this camera Yeah, some other night when I'm doing some proper deep space astrophotography and trying to do a deep space astrophotography, I'll probably make another attempt at a GPS satellite when I've got a more sensitive camera on the on the problem. Alright, that's not half bad, but I can do better. For one thing, I've got a focal reducer on there. For another thing, the image is inverted, which I can fix. There. Now the image is the right orientation, at least.
and the dust is probably mostly on the diagonal, the star diagonal. I'm going to take that off next. I don't know, it doesn't really show up once you get the moon in focus. Alright, I think that's a rather nice view right there. The touch of blue is just a camera artifact. That's just how the camera handles overexposure. It's not actually chromatic aberration or anything. This is a, a Schmidt Cassegrain, 8 inch Schmidt Cassegrain catadioptric. So, it doesn't suffer from chromatic aberration really. put some extra toys away here. Uh, let me fire up the soundtrack for this evening while I work on putting some extra equipment away.
glanced up and realized, oh dear, the moon is completely covered with clouds. <laughs> ah. Yeah, there's clouds moving in, sure enough. I can't even see Saturn by eye now. It was visible before, but now I can't even see Saturn. That's a shame. Well, good news, I did find the GPS satellite in the pictures I took. So, in a moment I will put the still image on the stream here and we'll review the final picture I took, the really long exposure. It went over probably about a minute, 20 seconds. And it almost washed out with just background light and thermal noise of the camera because it's not a it's not a cooled camera the way that um, say an s big is but even so it did just detect the satellite it's a little smudged by the tracking motion that's what I expect, and it's almost dead center, which is also what I expect, because the tracking was very accurate tonight. So even without optically tracking it, um, it dead centered it, basically. Which is good. So, let me see if I can denoise the image a little bit with a... Oh, I don't have... Oh, I don't have GMIC installed. Okay, well, never mind then. And it'll just stay as is. Tell you what, I can crop it though before I. I'm gonna crop it in GIMP and then save it. Well, the clouds went away for a moment. Um, I don't know how long they'll stay that way. There's definitely suddenly clouds moving into the area though. Oh, come on, GIMP, what is your problem? Okay, GIMP is crashing for some reason. I don't know, I updated my GIMP installation and it doesn't like the new version as well. Gives me errors. Try this one more time. Yeah, it's not a beautiful image, but... It helps if I actually go to grayscale on it. It uh, stands out a little bit better against the background, so we'll go to that. Okay. Come on. Let me save it. Before the clouds completely cover things up, I do want to take a quick look at Saturn. See what we 
dim. See if we can brighten that up. There we go. That's not bad. I'd really like to put the uh, Barlow lens on that, but I don't know if I'll have time. Clouds are already coming. But while that goes on, let me Share with you guys the image of the satellite from tonight, or the uh, GPS satellite. Um, there we are. So the satellite is the little smudge there in the middle of this picture. It's just barely above the background light level, as you can see. So it really did require long exposure to pick it up. But it's just that little faint smudge. And you can see the streaks, the, the long streaks going through the stars there, all much brighter than um, this satellite, which required a, over a minute exposure to actually pick it up. The SBIG camera is more sensitive and cooled and would be better on an object like this. So we may approach that subject again next time I do a deep space live stream. But for now, at least we got it. We can say we saw it. So that's cool. And there you can see Saturn going into the clouds, literally, just as I uh, click that picture off. It'll come back out for a moment, and then another little cloud will come along. The clouds are passing mostly to my south tonight. The north is clear, but there's not much to see, planet moon-wise. Hey, Sean. Good to see you. Yeah, you can see the Cassini division real well, and I don't even have the Barlow lens on there yet. I've got a brief gap of clouds here. I'm going to try. So out of focus, I can't even see the out of focus ring on it. Okay, or I just lost it somehow.
think that's probably Titan next to it there. Okay. Now, quickly. Again. Huh. Okay. I kind of see a smudge at the bottom left. Oops. It's not bad. What do you guys think? See if I can crank up the sharpness even more. Not a bad image of Saturn right there.
Can I spot Uranus? Um, probably not. Well, I mean, I could, but I'd have to totally redo the camera and everything. This is going to be the last object for the night. It's already after 10 o'clock here. So. Yeah, not, not tonight. Somebody's calling me a Satanist? Who's calling me a Satanist? Oh. Great. Yeah, no, I'm not a Satanist. I am a scientist, not Satanist. I'm an amateur astronomer, but I am a professional scientist. I see someone is calling scientists Satanists in the chat. Oh. Somebody timed him out? Sorry, guys, I haven't been able to pay attention to the chat much tonight. I've been busy working the telescope. But, yeah, you can see the ring division, the Cassini division, very easily. The scene's a little turbulent tonight, but not too, too bad. You can also see a hint of shadow being cast by the planet back onto the rings on the top end there. cloud coming. Sorry guys. Yeah, I, I, I work with a lot of scientists. I am a scientist and I don't know any who are Satanists. I'm certainly not one. Thank you Copernicus Thinker. Dollar Super chat donation there. And I saw you had a two dollar oh another dollar super chat up there. And another dollar super chat up there. Thanks, Copernicus. Just keep feeding me dollars. <laughs> what telescope do I have? I have an eight inch LX two hundred classic. And I've got a Samsung SDC four thirty five with a two X Barlow on it right now. Yeah, I, I was thinking that too, Sean, but we try to keep it family-friendly here on Astronomy Live.
keep playing with the brightness and contrast too, trying to find a balance because it keeps going in and out of clouds. We are going to get a clearing here in a second. There it comes. See if I can try to beat the seeing here. I do have the exposure cranked way up. Have a one thirtieth of a second exposure, and try to adjust the brightness maybe. Trying to find the perfect focus on the telescope here. A little tricky to do. That might be as good as it gets right there. We still got a lot of summer heat and uh, turbulence causing atmospheric seeing to be. The seeing's pretty turbulent tonight. Sean. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough, Sean. Well, it worked out well tonight because with uh, tracking satellites like I was, I had the camera ready, the right camera ready to go. This is the best camera for looking at Saturn. Of course. No camera is good for looking at Saturn when it's cloudy. Uh, that's just a little cloud. It should come back out. Yeah, Saturn is a is a bit of a life changing experience, and and seeing it for the first time in a telescope. I remember the dinky little 60, mil 60 millimeter refractor I had when I first saw it. And even then it was impressive. Knock your socks off impressive. Have I ever tried Neptune? Yes. Does it resolve to a disk? 
you can, in the eyepiece, I can tell it's not just a star, but in the images, it's hard to, it's hard to see. Is Jupiter easy to see with its size? Yes, it is. And that would have been a good target too, but it's getting low in the west now. It wouldn't be very great at this hour now. Saturn is really the main show of the evening. So I'd say we had a pretty successful night there. Tracked some low Earth orbit satellites. Ended off with a uh, rocket booster that put up a GPS satellite. Then we actually tracked a GPS satellite. Did some long exposures and finally with some... Uh, analysis of the full resolution images pulled it out there in the end and did see a faint smudge of a GPS satellite that the scope had tracked and had to do a long exposure over a minute long to pull out that satellite but it was there from 20,000 kilometers away yeah Titan is usually too far away to see with the Barlow too I don't even think it would be in the field of view I think it'd be a little a little far uh, just outside to the south, I suspect. Let me look with my phone here, see what Sky Safari shows. I did see a bright moon near Saturn. Um, yeah, that was Titan for sure. And I think it's going to be just outside the field of view to the south at the moment. And yeah, it might be a little too dim, but if I adjusted the brightness and contrast, I might be able to pull it out. Yeah, I mean, it, it Saturn, when you see it, makes you realize that, you know, it gives you a sense of the counterintuitive nature of space and how rings like that can exist and uh, it's just something totally outside of your normal day-to-day -day experience. We're used to seeing spherical objects around day-to-day, -day, but seeing a spherical object surrounded by rings like that, it's, it's very striking when you see it. What's the most affordable telescope to see this? I mean, I saw it back in the day with bog standard 60 millimeter Bushnell refractor on a wooden mount but I wouldn't recommend it because it's a bit frustrating to use because the mount was so rickety and the focus knob was pretty terrible it would shake the telescope or it would shift the telescope every time you tried to adjust the focus and uh, it was just a mess um, the one that I would recommend the most affordable would be a Dobsonian you get the most bang for your buck so you're going to spend a couple hundred bucks at least. Uh, but if you're after a budget telescope to just see the rings of Saturn through an eyepiece of a telescope, I'd recommend at least a 4-inch Dobsonian, but preferably 6 or 8-inch Dobsonian. Uh, and you'll see a lot of detail. This is an 8-inch telescope right here to give you some idea. And it's similar to what you see in a high-magnification eyepiece. Um, so I'm in Florida. Uh, the main source of light pollution tonight right now is the moon. Uh, I'm in a fairly dark remote area, so when the moon is not out, I can easily see the Milky Way, and I can do some deep space imaging from my house. It's one of the selling points to me, getting away from the city lights. Wasn't there a flat earther who said something about Saturn not being real? I don't know. I'm, I'm 
I'm getting it terribly confused. I think it was Orphan Red. She said something about Saturn not being real because when Cassim took the pictures, it wasn't an observer to collapse the quantum state of Saturn or something like that. I don't know. It was really goofy. Or basically, camera pictures aren't real because they're not observed. I forget the exact details. But it was bizarre. Supremely bizarre. Oh, and stars are souls. Well, that one, that one was funny too because he said he went to an observatory to see Saturn, and he didn't think he still didn't think it was real. The observatory he went to was the one I worked at when I was in college. It was the uh, uh, Crowley at uh, the Orlando Science Center. I used to work there in college as the manager on duty. So he might have been there. Who knows? That was a long time ago. I mean, I I stopped working there almost 15 years ago, but um, it's theoretically possible that uh, I was the one that showed him Saturn without realizing it. Wouldn't that be funny? <laughs> Occasionally you would get a wacky complaint from somebody, but I never recalled meeting anyone who claimed that what they were seeing through the telescope literally wasn't real. Sometimes they couldn't believe it, initially, but none of them actually confronted me and said, I don't think this is real, I think you're faking it. Yeah, it was Orphan Red, and you saw it on Simon Dan. Yeah, I probably saw it on Simon Dan too. I think, I think Red's rhetoric even told me about it. It was that crazy. Have I ever seen anything strange? Just odd. Um, yeah, there was a solar eclipse a few years ago. Not the 2017 eclipse. This was before that. It was a partial eclipse that I was watching from Florida. <coughs> And just a moment, just a minute or two before the eclipse started, I saw something fly across the sun, and I was live streaming it. It's actually still up on YouTube. If you search for solar eclipse videos on this channel, you'll find it. Um, you'll see my face there, I think. And uh, I was live streaming it from um, around town, and saw something fly across the sun. Now, I was overlooking a bay. And there was a barrier island on the other side of that bay. So I suspect, in hindsight, it was probably balloons that were tied together and released at a party or something. But it was, it looked bizarre. It looked like a morphing object. And I followed it until it left the sun. It transited across the sun. At first I thought it was an airplane, except that it seemed too slow. And then I looked closer and realized that was no airplane. Um, but I realized later it was probably a, a cluster of balloons tied together. It would have been about the right size. Calculating the distance to, that, to the nearest barrier island and looking at the angular size of the object, it would have corresponded to your typical size of you know, latex balloons. Um, <clears throat> so it adds up mathematically to be balloons, but of course nobody wants to hear that because that doesn't sound so exciting. I didn't know it at the time, though. It just, I was shocked. Because it didn't match with anything I had seen before. There was a time I actually saw a weather balloon. It actually was a weather balloon one time. Um, 
and it was at a sidewalk astronomy event I was doing with my club and one of the guys in the club said that's a weather balloon up there he was looking through his scope I'm like no you're kidding me and I grabbed my scope unfortunately I didn't have my camera at the time I didn't even have power with me that evening it was just the scope was unpowered and I moved it to where I saw what looked kind of like a planet sitting in the sky except it didn't correspond to the position of any known planet and I look at it sure enough wouldn't you know it it was a weather balloon I could see the balloon I could see the payload swinging underneath the balloon it was really wild so sometimes it is just a weather balloon reflecting the light of the Sun Uh, there were there was uh, Titan visible earlier in the evening, uh, Kitsune Cavalier. More exciting than a UFO recorded with a handheld potato. Yeah, that's true. Certainly had a more stable mounting to view it with. And it was actually this camera, the same camera I'm using right now. Different magnification, but same camera. to see if I could record uh, a video of this directly to my hard drive prior to YouTube streaming compression, but it uh, doesn't want to go. Oh. And I can't change any of the settings while I'm streaming, so, oh well, have to forego that. All right, have a good night, Sean. Yeah, I really like that. You can see the shadow of Saturn on the back of the rings as well. That's really cool. Ordered an Orion 944. 4E 11.6 inch. Really? That's cool. I'm not familiar with a 944E, but Orion makes good products. And an 11.6 11, 11 inch, almost 12 inch telescope should do you well. <laughs> That'll be really fun. This is better than Castaway starring Tom Hanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, I think. Seems like the clouds haven't gone crazy, at least. That's good. I am going to have to wrap up, though, probably in about five minutes or so. But I'm quite happy that... Uh, 
Well, the satellite tracking stuff all went well, and we got some good images here of the moon and Saturn, at least. I do want to steal a view myself through the eyepiece after I shut down the live stream. Sorry, I know you guys are going to be jealous about that, but uh, I do enjoy seeing it in the eyepiece. I mean, for all the work I do trying to get the best possible video and stuff, and trying to get the best possible images, nothing can do justice to what you see by eye um, through the eyepiece. It's just a different experience, of course. So any last questions here before I shut down the stream for the evening? often do I stream? Uh, depends on the season. During the summer here in Florida, we typically have poor weather, which prohibits streaming. This is actually the first semi-clear night I've had in weeks um, where I've been able to actually get out and stream. So during the winter months, I'll typically have a lot more streams, maybe a, a couple a month at least. But uh, otherwise, I try to aim to have at least one a month. Um, and I don't really schedule it well in advance because you just never know with the weather. So I play it by ear. Obviously, I have the most time available on the weekends, but um, even later on in the year, uh, as we get closer into winter, if there's something special, something interesting, then I'll try to get it, um, like a space station pass overhead. Um, I would like to live stream that using this two-computer setup. That worked well tonight. This was sort of a test for that. The idea of having one computer dedicated to actually tracking the satellite, another computer dedicated to streaming the view from the camera. Um, so I'll probably attempt that later this year. And, uh, you know, things like lunar eclipses, other things of that nature, transient events that happen to be interesting. We've got a Mercury transit coming up later this year in November. Um, so I'll probably try to do a dedicated stream for that of some sort. Hopefully the weather permits it. Um, so yeah, just stay tuned. If you subscribe and hit the bell, I do try to give you guys some heads up whenever possible. Uh, when I could see today that the weather was clear uh, a couple hours before stream, I went ahead and set up the event so as to give people a notification about it. Uh, so check the community tab, check my channel, and I uh, uh, hope to see a lot of you guys around uh, for more streams in the future. It looks so fake. Well, it looks surreal because it's quite outside your normal experience for sure. But it's very real. This is live footage. Here, I'll wave at you guys. Do that real quick. Just to prove. So you hear me hitting the buttons on the camera, shaking it. the unfocused disk caused by the telescope. And I can't see it, but I'm assuming that as I put my hand over the telescope, you could probably see that there. 
Oh, one more thing. Make sure. I guess I seen the one. He blurred a bit. Man, I can't even see my own screen when I'm in front of the telescope. Well, okay, I'm looking back at the screen now. Yeah, that's my hand in front of the telescope. So, hi guys. Good night. Hope you guys have a good evening. Thanks, Copernicus. Check out that link, RE Extra Solar Imaging. Uh, okay, did you send me a link? Let's see it. Uh, if you could post it in the comments of the video, Copernicus, I'll take a look. Here's a link to that eight minute video about what I was chatting with you about a couple weeks ago, extrasolar imaging extrasolar planets via our sun's gravitational lensing. Oh, that sounds interesting. Yeah. I don't see the link, but um, post it in the comments of this video and I'll, I'll definitely check it out. Was Mercury visible during the 2017 total solar eclipse? Ah, by memory, I, I remember seeing Venus. I don't remember if I saw Mercury. I might have, but that was two years ago now and it's been so long my memory's a little faded on that i mostly remember the, the the most stunning and striking thing of course was the solar corona and three very prominent spikes coming off of the solar corona uh, those are the main things i saw that in, in venus uh, so yeah where's my telescope located florida all right guys have a good evening thanks for watching clear skies folks